Welcome back, everybody, once again to Johnny Torch Live. This is number 81 of our series of live broadcasts, and today we're bringing you a Torch News Roundup number 90, 90 big episodes in the series of the Torch News Roundup. And unfortunately, today we're going to start off with a very sad topic as uh, Margot Kidder has passed on, the actress who played Lois Lane, in my mind, the definitive actress who played Lois Lane during the late 70s, throughout the 80s, during the Donner films and the subsequent sequels, alongside Christopher Reeve, which, of course, many would agree is the definitive Superman portrayal, particularly in the modern era. And uh, sadly, she passed on this week at the age of 69 from as yet undisclosed cause. And we just want to take a couple of minutes here at the beginning of the show to pay tribute to Margot. And I certainly have always admired her and her portrayal of Lois Lane. Uh, she's the definitive portrayal of Lois Lane in my mind, bar none. And uh, she's a supremely talented actress, of course. She was supremely adept at both comedy and drama, as evidenced in the Superman films. And I think the key to it is that she always looked on the Man of Steel in admiration. Uh, Margot even admitted this in a documentary that was in one of the DVD releases of the original Donner Superman, where she said, in, in order to really get the role, she knew she had to look like she was really in love with a guy. And that was her strategy to get the role, but it actually played into a very strong theme that was very old school very, you know, classic 30s Superman. Her Lois was an old school heroine, but in a very modern context. She was plucky and brave, smart and adventurous, but she still retained that classic leading lady role from the pulps. I'm reminded of Dale Arden from the Flash Gordon serials with Buster Crabbe, where the sun rose and set on the hero, and she admired him for what he was, a sort of hero worship. When it was all right to admit that, he was someone greater than she was, and they were incomplete without each other. That's what made theirs one of the great romances in films, comics or otherwise. Yet she never took the spotlight off him. Never, we are Superman or Team Superman. It was a bygone day where the leading lady was expected to be a support to the hero and not try to outshine him in these SJW times. That's not allowed anymore. There's no female lead supporting the male lead and basically having him show his masculinity by some, by being supported by, his leading lady. That's something that's been totally lost throughout the generations. And it was, and of course, because of the fear of toxic, toxic masculinity. But it was one of the things that really caused the romance of Superman and Lois to stand out, uh, particularly, as I said, in this modern context. She was fiercely protective of him, like in Superman 2, the famous diner scene with the bully, when she literally was trying to tear him apart. So this was not a shy, shrinking violet Lois. This, of course, was the Lois that we all knew and loved from the comics, who was a strong woman and an independent woman and a smart and adventurous woman, as I said. But she did not divest herself of the femininity that Lois should have and that, you know, every leading lady should possess, where she was also kind and loyal and loving and generous and that's something that we don't see all that much anymore from our leading ladies say what you will about superman 4 but she was also the emotional core of that story she has a very touching scene where superman is thought dead at the hands of nuclear man and she confides her feelings to clark about superman 
And she acted it with such emotion. And you could tell the depth of her devotion to Superman. And that is something else that very rarely gets the emphasis in films and, and television today, where there is a bond greater than just romance, greater than just physical attraction. They were soulmates. And you felt very strongly that even though he was set apart from her and was, as she put it, a god in, in the song, Can You Read My Mind, they were still very much equals. And it was her loving care and generosity that sustained him that he always looked upon her with such devotion as well. And again, she was just a supremely talented actress, shamefully underrated. And she got put through the emotional ringer in Superman 2 as well. And she acted the heck out of it every single step of the way in every sense. Uh, she was up to the challenge of this role, Margot Kidder, in a way that very few actresses could then or now. And I, I, I think that Amy Adams has done her due diligence. She grew up with this portrayal of Lois as her inspiration, the same as many of us. So, uh, you know, I, I stop short from saying that, you know, her empathy with Lois hasn't extended to other actresses. As I said, I believe Amy Adams pretty much is trying to draw from the same well in her portrayal of Lois. But there was something about Margot Kidder's performance that really struck a chord. It really struck home. And it probably also has to do, of course, of the acting of Christopher Reeve and the writing of the films by Tommy Mankiewicz. That also brought out something that no other Superman film has been able to. And she had great support in that sense. But no other actress, I believe, then or now could have really put their imprint on this character the way Lois did. If you've seen the documentary, as I said, where there are several actresses, big name actresses at the time that were trying out for the role of Lois, none of them had that quality. None of them had that character, that spark, that genuine emotion that she felt for Superman. And again, as I said, her uh, interplay back and forth with Clark, very comedic stuff that, again, could have been played. She made it endearing that she thought of Clark as the lovable goof. She didn't think little of him, that he was, you know, beneath her in any way. Even though her heart belonged to Superman, she still had that generosity and that empathy for Clark as well. And that's something that I said probably wouldn't show up in any other actress. Many actresses couldn't play that balance too well, where you totally bought that she had that empathy for Clark as well as the emotion for Superman. And uh, it's such a relief at the end of Superman 2 when Superman spares her that burden of hiding his identity. And he chooses to bear that burden of the knowledge of what happened alone. and by himself has to bear that burden because his love for her was so great that he didn't want to see her suffer with this knowledge alone since they weren't going to be able to be together in the sense that she wanted. Again, a very romantic portrayal and the best romantic portrayal of, I think, two characters, either comic book or otherwise, in any film. And so, again... Margot, you were the definitive Lois Lane for me and for an entire generation of which I'm very grateful. And so rest in peace. I'd like to think she's up there now with Chris going over old times, reunited with him. And again, we shall never see her like again in the comic book genre or in the action hero genre. She was to me, the quintessential leading lady. And, uh, I can't praise her enough. So once again, thank you, Margo, for all of your service and what you've done for us. And I personally uh, were very moved by your portrayal as Lois Lane. 
So sadly, with that business out of the way, we will move on now to some more stories that uh, a pretty slow business day uh, week, I, I suppose, uh, in comic related properties and stuff. But we did get some news about the upcoming DC Universe uh, streaming service has released some info on a new proposed series for Doom Patrol. Now, this is a book and group that I am not very familiar with. Uh, Apparently, they have ordered a 13-episode first season of hour-long installments developed by Greg Berlanti, who is working on DC Universe's Titans, and, of course, he produces the Arrowverse uh, he will pro- he'll be producing this series with Supernatural's Jeremy Carver on board as head writer. Now, Doom Patrol has already been scheduled to appear in Titans. They are going to be as follows. Robot Man, which I guess you'll see them in this picture that I've got up. Negative Man, uh, the guy with the bandages, I guess. Elastigirl, who I don't know if that's her in this picture. and Crazy Jane, Crazy Jane, Crazy Old Maurice. They'll be led by mad scientist Dr. Niles Calder, known as the Chief. And um, Deadline has got this um, uh, description here, which I haven't read, so this will illuminate us a little bit here. The guy looks like a sort of a cross between Sean Connery and uh, Professor X. I don't know who he is, the Chief, I guess. The Doom Patrol's members each suffered horrible accidents that gave them superhuman abilities, but also left them scarred and disfigured. Traumatized and downtrodden, the team found purpose through the Chief, who brought them together to investigate the weirdest phenomena in existence and protect Earth from what they find. Part support group, part superhero team, the Doom Patrol is a band of superpowered freaks who fight for a world that wants nothing to do with them. So... Uh, I guess, I guess apparently the other part of this story that is making news is that it's been revealed that iconic DC character Victor Stone, a.k.a. Cyborg, is going to have a role in this show, which is curious because DC Universe's Titans would be the place you'd expect to see Cyborg show up, but uh, no, no word on him ever appearing in that series so far but he'll be in this show. So very interesting. Uh, Sources have claimed that perhaps he would be off limits due to his being in the Justice League and part of the DCU at large, but apparently that's not the case. Now, there's no casting details yet, but apparently these roles have already been cast for Titans, so we know that they'll be reprising their roles. Uh, Robot Man will be played by Jake Michaels. April Bowbury or Balbri will be playing Elastigirl, Dwayne Murphy as Negative Man, and Bruno Beicher as The Chief. There has been no release date scheduled, but uh, the series is assumed to arrive in 2019. So what do you think about that there news? Are you interested in the Doom Patrol? Are you excited to see them on the small screen? Uh, Let me know what you think in the comments below. And we will move on now to uh, some more rumor mill stuff here about the Birds of Prey feature. According to Heroic Hollywood, Birds of Prey is aiming to start production in January of 2019. Uh, Director Kathy Yen has been hired, and they hope to hire an all-female crew to work on the movie as well. Margot Robbie herself is producing the movie in addition to starring as Harley Quinn. Apparently, Birds of Prey is taking Suicide Squad's 2 spot, which was supposed to film later this year. Instead, it is now expected to start shooting shortly after Birds of Prey wraps next year. So the posed Suicide Squad 2, which was to star um, Will Smith and bring that whole crew back together, is going to be postponed in favor of this film, which makes sense because they were saying that they didn't know if they could get Will Smith back in time after... Um, his work on Aladdin. And um, it's been too long that we've been waiting for Margot Robbie to return as Harley Quinn. It's good to see that they have something lined up for her, at least 
in the near future. All right, and before we wrap it up for this evening's edition, we also have news that broke very late today about an upcoming prequel series starring Alfred Pennyworth. Uh, this is said not to be a spinoff of Gotham, so it's not a it's not a done deal that this is going to have anything to do with um, Sean Pertwee or you know the origin from that character on the show. This might be completely different uh, and likely will be completely different. Um, supposedly the story will revolve around Alfred learning how to bottle his crash course in Oxford and his uh, hiring by Thomas Wayne and how he learned how to dust properly and satisfy Aunt Harriet with his cutlery. I'm just kidding, of course. No, this is going to be um, the, according to the um, uh, statement here, uh, it's going to be revolving around Alfred Pennyworth, the best friend and butler to Bruce Wayne, a.k.a. Batman. The series is not a Gotham spinoff, but rather an entirely new story exploring Alfred's origins as a former British SAS soldier who forms a secret company and goes to work with Thomas Wayne, Bruce's billionaire father, in 1960s London. That's kind of interesting. Um, I don't know. I mean, do we want to keep going back further and further with these prequels? DC is dead set on the prequel. They love their prequels, don't they? Um, we got Krypton going back to Superman's grandfather, which is a good show. I am not going to, you know, criticize that. But now we're going back to Alfred. I mean, this almost we're almost at the stage again of Aunt May, the series. You know, let's get Aunt May, the, the miniseries out and, you know, show how she, you know, married Ben Parker and stuff. I don't know. It's just how far back do we have to keep going with these shows? But I don't know. In a statement... Epic's president, Michael Wright, said, as genuine fans of these classic DC characters, as well as the incredibly talented Bruno Heller and Danny Cannon, we couldn't be more excited to make Epic's the home of this series. We can't wait to work with Bruno and Danny, along with Peter Roth, Susan Rovner, Brett Paul, and the team at Warner Horizon on this fantastic origin story. So, I don't know. Apparently, this is going to be from the Epic's channel. I'm not sure exactly how that works. I don't think this is going to be um, from, yeah, it says here, Epics has served up a 10 episode straight to series order for Pennyworth, the second Batman prequel series. So yeah, this is not going to be on DC Universe's streaming service there. This is going to be Epics. And interestingly enough, they're going straight to 10 episodes. So that's probably the smart thing to do if they're not going to melt that concept dry because I don't really know what they could do with it beyond, like I said, you know, if you're going to take Alfred back into the, you know, the army days or whatever you want to call it, the British army, I don't really see how you tie that into Batman. Because you see where Krypton is having its strength is that, well, spoilers if you haven't seen Krypton, but they're bringing in Brainiac. General Zod goes back to the past. We've got Adam Strange, which is sort of a slight connective tissue to Superman himself. And of course, with Gotham, you had the Smallville-esque scenario of all his villains arriving before he arrives at being Batman. So you had some kind of connective tissue. I don't know where this here would fit in. You can't have Batman time traveling to meet a young Alfred. I don't think that's going to work anyway. We'll see. But uh, tell me what you think in the comments below. Are you excited about an Alfred, Alfred Pennyworth series? Alfred the series. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Again, as I said, it's a very brief show. We don't have uh, much more to talk about here, but I do want to briefly remind you about my appearance this Saturday. This is our last show before I'll be making my appearance in Peabody, Massachusetts, this Saturday, May the 19th at the Peabody Institute Library. I will be autographing copies of The Adventures of Bullets Bourbon. I have got a lot of goodies that I can't wait to show you guys. I have them all made, and you know, hopefully I can give them away as um, perks for some of the sales, or you can buy them independently, I suppose. But still, uh, can't wait to unveil these uh, goodies there at Peabody Institute Library on May 19th at Peabody, Massachusetts. So uh, check it out, and I hope to see you there. And of course, I have another 
uh, date on my convention circuit lined up for June the 10th, which will be at the Radisson Hotel for KidsCon uh, for the uh, Nashua, New Hampshire appearance. Um, you can check out all this information on my website. You can find uh, the link in the description below. Also, check me out on Twitter for more updates on any upcoming dates that I might find in the Boats Bourbon Circuit Tour 2019. But yes, check out PillCon 19, I mean, PillCon 18 on May the 19th for my next appearance. So once again, I want to thank you. Please hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. If you haven't, uh, leave me a comment in the description in the uh, comment section below. And uh, yeah, I'd love to see a turnout at the uh, Peabody Institute Library on May the 19th for PillCon, second annual PillCon uh, 2018. Until next we meet, this is Johnny Torch reminding you once again, keep the flame burning brightly. And I'll be with you again real soon.